great. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to go really fast with the talk, and so I apologize if uh, if I hurry, if I speak, if I speak a slur. I'll try to articulate, but there are no white spaces. I've limited all of those to my talk to save time. I'm going to speak today about um, miracles, materialism, and quantum mechanics. I'm a research scientist in the chemistry department here, uh, just over in French sciences. Um, and quantum mechanics has been my professional passion for about 10 years now. I, I think it's beautiful. And so I hopefully can share some of that enthusiasm with you tonight. But I also want to look at how quantum mechanics challenges some things that we might think as common sensical beliefs about the way reality works. So here's an outline of my talk. I'll begin, I want to frame the talk by asking some questions about what we think, oh, what's going on? What's that? Oh, it's very long, it's very organized. It's how I can talk, yes. Um, so I want to frame the discussion tonight with some questions about uh, the nature of reality, essentially. So what do we assume about the way reality works? Uh, just, and then take the intuitive ideas. So, for instance, here are 13 ideas, or assumptions, yes, that's Doc Brown from Back to the Future. I didn't know if you guys would get that. You were born around the time of the uh, movie today, right? So, uh, but here are just 13 of the foundational assumptions we must make about the nature of reality, even to do science. So, for instance, we have to assume that the world is rational, not totally chaotic. We have to assume that we can understand it uh, as human beings. And there are a lot of other things that we just take for granted whenever we do science. You can't do science without a philosophy of science. But speaking personally, there are also some basic assumptions that we all make, or many of us make, about reality on a daily basis. Now, I'm going to focus specifically on the worldview of naturalism. That's the worldview that says that nature is all there is. There is nothing outside of nature or beyond nature that we determine supernatural. Now, I'm not saying that all naturalists believe these, uh, these ideas, but I think it's probably pretty, uh, pretty widespread. So, for instance, uh, idea one, the laws of physics state that miracles are impossible. They just can't happen. Number two, even if God does exist, then he couldn't perform miracles because he'd have to violate the laws of nature that he himself created. That would be clumsy. Number three, consciousness, or the mind, is not a separate entity. It's just a collective property of the neurons in our brain, just like wetness is a collective property of the mo of molecules of water. And number four, the universe does not contain hidden or unknowable realities that are inaccessible to observation or to science. Now, so I want to frame our discussion of quantum mechanics tonight with these sort of foundational assumptions and say, if we know about quantum mechanics, what does it do to these assumptions? Does it challenge them? And the answer that I would give is yes, it challenges them very fundamentally. Okay, so now let's dive into the bulk of the talk, which will be about quantum mechanics, the history of it, its basic assumptions, and then some of the philosophical uh, implications of quantum mechanics at the end of the talk. Okay, <clears throat> so we all are familiar with Newtonian mechanics, believe it or not. If you live in the world, which I'm, most of you probably do, uh, <laughs> you're familiar with Newtonian mechanics or classical mechanics. Because it's mechanics of everyday objects. We all probably learned the new three laws of motion in the high school physics. And they simply describe the motion of things like cars, anvils, basketballs. And uh, since the end of the 17th century, for about 200 years, Newtonian or classical mechanics was the only paradigm we had for understanding uh, the way that, uh, that, the, that reality operates. And it was remarkably successful. We were able to describe the motion of planets. Uh, we were able to build machines like clocks and trains. But around the turn of the, the century, there were a few experiments that really were stones in the shoes of uh, physicists. They were things that you could not explain by a recourse to classical mechanics. As surprised people might. They were just confusing. And then something very radical happened. <clears throat> around 1900, uh, Max Planck introduced the Planck constant, and for the next 30 or 40 years, people develop what's known today as quantum mechanics. Um, and it revolutionized the way we think about nature, reality, and even science. Now, so what's the difference between classical and quantum mechanics? Why are they so different even fundamentally? The answer is that when we look at the microscopic realm of atoms and molecules and, and elementary particles, essentially, classical mechanics is just a scaled-down version of everyday mechanics. 
So I have a three-year-old son. I was explaining to him what an atom is. I said, <laughs> no, I, I really was. Um, and I said, you know, Adrian, an atom is like a really, 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 really tiny piece of dust. In other words, if you take a, a baseball and shrink it down a quadrillion times, that's the way we think about electrons, atoms, molecules, at least in, in, quantum mechanics, oh, sorry, in classical mechanics. But quantum mechanics is not like that. The uh, microscopic objects on quantum mechanics are not simply scaled down versions of everyday objects. They obey incredibly strange and unintuitive laws. And although our understanding of quantum mechanics has changed in the last hundred years, in other words, the implications of quantum mechanics and the applications have become more and more understood, the basic foundations have not changed in a hundred years. It's a remarkably successful theory of physics. <clears throat> Uh, now, sometimes it's said that quantum mechanics is the physics of the small, the very, very small objects. Now, that's not entirely true. Quantum mechanics describes all objects, whether they're big, like elephants or even pins, or whether they're small, like molecules. It's uh, better to say that quantum mechanics is only visible at small length scales. So, here's an illustration. Imagine you have a computer screen. If you look at a picture on the screen, you see a picture, right? But if you were to zoom in on the picture very close, you would see individual pixels of red, green, and blue. But if you step back from that screen, you wouldn't be able to see the pixels at all. In the same way, if you look at uh, uh, objects on a large length scale like elephants, they look normal. But if you zoom into those objects, everything begins to look quantum mechanical. So really, the laws of quantum mechanics describe everything, even an object like elephants and galaxies, but it's at too large a length scale for us to see them. They're not visible to us at that, that level. <clears throat> Now, even though quantum mechanics describes uh, or is visible only at small length scales, it's still incredibly important. So, for instance, without quantum mechanics, uh, many biological reactions would occur, so we would have no life. Chemical bonding would be impossible, so we have no molecules. Even atoms depend on quantum mechanics for their stability. And I wouldn't have a PhD. That's the worst of all. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line, though, is the universe as we know it would not exist without quantum mechanics. Okay, it's not in minor sort of uh, footnote okay, in, in the nature of reality. Okay, so what is quantum mechanics? Well, I've boiled it all down to three fundamental postulates. I want to talk about those postulates and then describe the implications of those postulates. You will not have to understand any of the equations that might happen to fly up on the screen here. They're just things in these pictures. Um, <laughs> so I'll try to describe to you what they mean. Okay, postulate number one. All the information about a particle is provided by an object called a wave function. So this is a we call psi. Psi is actually the function of the variable x. Now a function is just like a function that we're familiar with. For instance, it plots the temperature of Durham as a function of the time of day. Here, the wave function of a particle is a function of the variable x, where x is the position of the particle. So the wave function describes the probability of finding a particle at the position x. So for instance, the wave function says, there's a 1% chance of finding the particle here, a 3% chance to here, a 2% chance here, etc. Now, what are the implications of this idea that every particle in the universe is associated with a wave function? Well, there are a couple. Uh, the first is known as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. If I have a classical object like a baseball, a classical baseball, then I can tell you exactly what its position and momentum is at the same time. Baseball is here and it's headed at my face at 10 meters per second. And that would be bad. <laughs> but if I have a quantum mechanical baseball, I cannot tell you both its position and momentum simultaneously. All I can say is, well, the baseball is somewhere in this region and it's, headed, it's moving between 9 and 11 meters per second towards my face. Now, that's not a limitation on our ability to measure the momentum and the position. It's a fundamental limit on how anyone can know position and momentum simultaneously. There's a limit, a fundamental limit on that. Um, second implication. Imagine I have a classical elephant and it has two possible states. It can be gray or it can be multicolored. Now if I have a quantum mechanical elephant, it can also be in the state gray or in the state multicolored. But quantum particles can be in what's called a superposition state. It can be in two states at the same time. It can be both gray and multicolored at the same time. Now, what does that even mean? <laughs> no one knows, right? So that's, that's what quantum mechanics tells us. It's a very, again, a very unintuitive result. Postulate number two. The motion of particles is governed by the Schrodinger equation. 
Uh, <laughs> if you guys are real nerds, this is the famous one you'll see, H psi equals U psi. But uh, the motion of particles is governed by the Schrodinger equation rather than Newton's equation. So what does that imply? <clears throat> a couple things. Uh, first of all, a thing called quantum tunneling can occur. So imagine I have a classical soccer ball and I give it a kick up a hill. If I don't kick it hard enough, it will simply roll back down the hill because it does not have sufficient energy to go over the hill. But if I have a quantum mechanical soccer ball and I kick it, it can simply tunnel through the hill and end up on the other side. You guys are laughing. This is, this is a basis for the scanning tunneling electron microscope. This is used all over the world today. Without tunneling, we wouldn't have these things in our labs. But even though it's an incredibly bizarre property, uh, it's, again, foundational. We understand it very well, and yes, but it is bizarre. Um, <laughs> this is not even the word stuff yet. So, possible number two also implies that uh, quantum particles take all paths. Imagine I have a classical mouse. I can follow its trajectory through the maze, and at every point in time, it's at a given location in the maze. It takes a single path, and I can follow it. If I have a quantum mechanical mouse, uh, it takes every possible path to get to the cheese. And now, the really crazy paths, they have a very small probability associated with them. But nonetheless, they contribute to the total outcome of seeing the mouse at the end, of, uh, sorry, seeing the mouse at the cheese at the end. Again, incredibly bizarre. And finally, postulate number three. This is the most radical postulate of all, but it's very hard to explain in words. It's easier to understand than that. Um, <laughs> but it says simply that every that the properties of objects, the properties like position, momentum, things like color, sort of, um, are associated with mathematical objects called operators here. Now, what does this mean? Many things that are very, very important. So first of all, Quantum mechanics is intrinsically probabilistic. Here's an example. Imagine I have a classical elephant, and I know for a fact the elephant is gray before I measure it. If I measure the elephant, the color of the elephant, what is the chance that I'll see the outcome gray? 100%. I am absolutely certain that if the elephant was gray before, me before measurement, it will be in the same state after measurement. Now, what if I have a quantum elephant, and before measurement, I know for a fact it's in the state multicolored and gray at the same time. I say, can you tell me with certainty what outcome I will measure? And the answer is no. You'll have to say, well, half the time you'll see multicolored and half the time you'll see gray, but you cannot know in advance what you'll measure. There's a fundamental uh, probability associated with measurement in quantum mechanics. And again, this has nothing to do with uh, the sensitivity of our measurement device or our lack of knowledge about the system. This is fundamental to quantum mechanics. Uh, implication two, <clears throat> measurement necessarily alters the system being measured. Again, take our elephant. If it's gray before the measurement, I measure it, and it's gray after the measurement. Not so with quantum mechanics. If the quantum elephant is both multicolored and gray before measurement, then after the measurement, it will be in a different state. It will either be multicolored or it will be gray but it will no longer be in the superposition state of multicolored and gray. Measurement will change the state of the particle, and that, again, is unavoidable, no matter how sensitive our measurement device is. And finally, I'm going to skip even the word picture that I'm going to draw on this page. And just say, and the final implication is something really radical. And he believes something called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is the traditional interpretation. This says that particles, objects, do not have properties independent of measurement. We'll come back to this later. That's a radical statement, and not everyone accepts that entirely, but it's, you'll see what many people do. Okay. Now, what are some of the interpretations of quantum mechanics? Everything I've said to you in this talk up till now is basically universally recognized fact. No one disputes any of these. It's not that any physicist say yes, all of that is just factual. But the next part of the talk is going to be about interpretation. Now, as people differ on these interpretations, they differ legitimately because um, every all of these three interpretations that I'm going to list, they agree on all of the experimental facts. They can neither be confirmed nor disconfirmed by recourse to experiments, or indeed any experiment we can imagine. We don't even know how we can tell apart how which of these interpretations is true. They can't all be true, but there's no experimental way to determine which is true. Um, 
And so really we have to appeal to metaphysics or philosophy to decide which of these interpretations is more likely to be true. 